Hey there folks, I'm Mark in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. I don't remember. I'm not sure how much I want to value this week. On the one hand, it's the recovery post-album bombs and likely more representative of the normal, but on the other hand, while I think the impact of Lil Wayne's next album, Funeral, will be muted, it could well be just as disruptive. We don't know. It doesn't have the hyper quality of the Carter 5, but we all saw how big that blew up. We, again, we just don't know yet. Regardless, the top 10 isn't moving that much, especially with The Box by Roddy Rich solidifying its entrance hold on the number one thanks to the obscene streaming and YouTube margin. The radio finally getting on board, that's just gravy. And Life is Good by Future featuring Drake, it's just not moving in a way to catch up beyond number two. Yeah, similar huge streaming, but the radio is much slower and the sales will not get it there. Now we did see a slight revival for Circles by Post Malone at number three, but that's more because of Eminem's Godzilla falling out of the top ten. This lost the top spot on the radio and while streaming Streaming is actually up, Post Malone's sales are down. And this means Memories by Maroon 5 actually made a bit of a move up to number 4, taking the top spot on the radio even as its own sales are down. Then we got the rebound for Someone You Love by Louis Capaldi at number 5. He had a good sales week even as his radio drips away steadily. It happens. And two songs holding relatively steady. 10,000 Hours by Dan Shea and Justin Bieber at number 6 despite some consistent losses. And Dance Monkey by Tones and I at number 7 just not able to narrow that margin enough yet across the board, although it is holding consistent in all categories, which is promising. Then we saw a slight pickup for Roxanne by Arizona Service at number 8. I blame a stubborn amount of radio, but the bigger story to me comes with our two new breakthroughs in the top 10. Don't Stop Now by Dua Lipa at number 9, riding a ton of radio, although how she lags in streaming and sales is worrisome, and Everything I Wanted by Billie Eilish at number 10, riding both a Grammy boost, and the sort of slow radio traction you would expect for a low-key cut like this, and the video only helps. Now, of course, the one thing that tends to be the most telling post-album bomb is what continues to fall off besides the remnants, so let's get to our losers and dropouts, where the only notable one in the latter category is Take What You Want by Post Malone featuring Travis Scott and Ozzy Osbourne, which frankly had a way better run than you would ever expect, and it was a complete mistake not to make it a proper single. But as for our losers... Well, for Eminem, we had You Gonna Learn with Royce to 5'9 at 99, Unaccommodating with Young M.A. at 97, Darkness Falling to 91, Those Kind of Nights with Ed Sheeran at 86, and to round things out for Mac Miller, Blue World at 78, and Good News at 54. Beyond that... Well, Graveyard by Halsey lost the expected album boost at 64. What a Man Gotta Do by Jonas Brothers slid off its debut to 30. I'm a little bit shocked how little buzz I've seen around this song. And Panini by Lil Nas X fell down to 49. Honestly, it just might be heading out naturally. It had a really consistent and frankly unexpected run. Now, the bigger story comes with all our returns and our gains. And let's start with the former because in none of these I see much in the way of consistent traction going forward. It also doesn't help that most of them really suck. Jerry Sprunger by Tory Lanez and T-Pain back at 81. Slow Dance in a Parking Lot by Jordan Davis at 84. Camelot by Emily Chapa at 92. July by Noah Cyrus featuring Leon Bridges back at 98. The only dubious quality I see here is Come Through by Summer Walker and Usher at 90 and maybe Vite by Bad Bunny at 87 and that's not saying much. And I wish I could say our gains are better but you know what let's focus on the good news and that is Billie Eilish who along with everything you wanted also saw bad guys surge up to 17 off the Grammy wins. Good for her, even if it's also probably for the same reason that Truth Hurts by Lizzo went up to 32. Now, the much larger story, however, seems to be the huge swell of country and country-adjacent music that exploded up this week. Nobody But You by Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani up to 43. That's the big boost. But we all saw Homesick by Kane Brown at the 52. I Hope by Gabby Barrett at 56. What She Wants Tonight by Luke Bryan at 65. More Hearts Than Mine by Ingrid Andress at 68. I Wish Grandpas Never Die by Riley Green at 70. Make Me Want To by Jimmy Allen at 72. We Back by Jason Aldean at 74. I Hope You're Happy Now by Carly Pearson and Lee Bryce at 75. And even Homecoming Queen by Kelsey Ballerini at 76. And I point all this out because the rest of our games 
they're kind of all over the place. Sucker by the Jonas Brothers got its newest wind at 39. Slide by Her featuring YG continues its steady rise to 57. Did not see that coming. Heart on Ice by Rod Wave rebounded nicely to 59. Best on Earth by Russ and Bia rose up to 62. This can stop any time now. As well as can Out West by Jack Boys featuring Young Thug returning to 63. As does No Idea by Don Tolliver at 66. And rounding things out we saw Make No Sense by Young Boy Never Broke Again at 79. And Easy by Danny Lee featuring Chris Brown at 89. What I am going to keep a little bit more of an eye on though is Say So by Doja Cat at 73. Right now she's getting the push from the label that Kesha probably deserves as well. So we'll see exactly how much that will pay off for her. My suspicion is not as much as she might think. But, as expected, we got a pretty reasonable crop of new arrivals, starting with a surprise with number 100, Dive Bar by Garth Brooks and Blake Shelton. Of a dive bar. You know, it always perturbs me a little bit that Garth Brooks has less Hot 100 hits than you might think. Originally, country singles were blocked from the Hot 100 chart proper until they were specifically issued outside the country market, which is why all those number ones from diamond-selling albums in the 90s never hit the Hot 100. He actually notched charting hits after the rules changed in December 98 from the goddamn Chris Gaines album, of all things, and suddenly it becomes a big deal that he's working with Blake Shelton, of all people, to get here. Shame that Garth Brooks his timbre in his voice isn't quite what it once was, and his delivery sounds a little bit weedy against an otherwise solid honky-tonk drinking song, especially compared to Blake Shelton's lower vocals, but it's certainly likable with the pedal steel and the saloon piano. That being said, it is pretty lightweight from the both of these guys, likely only here on the strength of the collaboration and name recognition, and not what something I can really see lasting, even with country radio becoming a little more comfortable with the neo-traditional stuff. But yeah, it's not great, but... Not bad either. Number 96, Catch by Brett Young. Can't you beat the boys the same old thing? Am I the only one who's kind of surprised that we haven't seen more of Brett Young the past year or so? He had some real success breaking through all that boyfriend country mold while keeping his tones a little bit more breezy and organic a couple of years back, but it seems like he's already been lapped by a lot of the mainstream, and now? Well, we got another single from late 2018 from his album then, and I'm not really impressed. Part of this is his reedy voice that isn't really all that well blended with the backing vocals, the slapdash integration of the drum machines and the strings, and the smoothing synth effects that do not feel organic, and that's one of his strengths. But I'm frankly more annoyed that on the final lines of the hook, he's trying to rhyme self with breath. Pro tip, if you're going to flood your rhymes, don't do it on your hook. Now combine that with a song that's leaning really heavily on everything that he could catch in the song to try and elevate a pretty generic hookup tune. Yeah, you know what, I'm starting to figure out why we haven't heard much of Brett Young anymore. Just saying. Number 95, What If I Told You I Love You by Ali Gott. Yeah, what if I told you that I la 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 love you? And speaking of names I didn't expect to see again, look, Ali Gotti found more traction in the Toronto market specifically thanks to It's You. It's kind of inescapable up here. A song that I found clunky and thoroughly mediocre. But now he's got a second single circulating, working off a slightly smoother but considerably more basic guitar line and slightly better blended percussion clicking, but also more because it got picked up by TikTok. But it's also the sort of clingy and not particularly likable song that I didn't like the first time from this guy. This time written post-breakup where she's clearly moved on and he's whinging about all the unanswered questions that he wanted to ask her. Unaware of that by putting all of it in the song, he's kind of already saying all this. There's no secret. There's no tension there. I mean, don't get me wrong. I hear the appeal of stuff like this in R&B, but there's something really cloying about his delivery that just kind of rubs me the wrong way. Still not a fan. Next, number 94, First Man by Camila Cabello. She's good. So, if we've got one thing that characterized a bunch of our new arrivals this week, it's that they're cuts that got some airtime thanks to the Grammys, with this one being the closing track from Camila Cabello's last album, Romance. And I'll repeat what I said when I reviewed the album. I don't doubt this song's sincerity, and I'd argue it is probably one of the better produced songs on the album thanks to Phineas actually knowing how to mic her voice opposite the spare piano. But there's something just kind of weird about Camila singing to her father that he's the first man who ever loved 
loved her. It's really backwards looking and paternal when guys make songs like this, and it happens all the time in the country, and the note just gets weirder when Camila herself sings it. The writing just feels a little bit off to fully stick the landing. Don't get me wrong, this is not bad per se, but the execution's a lot better than the idea at the core. That's all I'm saying. Number 93, Underdog by Alicia Keys. Even now what you love, you'll find that someday soon enough you will rise up, rise up. Okay, can somebody please explain to me what the hell Alicia Keys is doing with this next album rollout, now pushing this thanks to a lot of Grammys attention? Now, don't get me wrong, she's always felt a little bit of a half step or two outside of trends in R&B, but I've never really cared because she's got the raw talent and the presence to transcend it, which makes it really weird. She's got Ed Sheeran on acoustic guitar and a Shape of You cadence that made me swear that he's got a writing credit and yet he doesn't, all against a blocky drum line that feels like it never develops the glorious swell to really knock this hook out of the park. Instead going for this steel drum post-chorus that does not pay off. And the lyrics have that same sort of odd distance as she talks to a homeless man and her cab driver before making a big hook dedicated to the underdog, presumably them, but the focal point of the emotion in the pre-chorus thanks to her using first-person pronouns, it's on Alicia Keys, which kind of neuters any sort of bigger, overwhelming populist impact. And that's kind of a damn shame because there's more groove and character to this than on a lot of modern Alicia Keys songs and she does sound great here, so it's utterly exasperating that it feels so misspent. So while I think there are enough pieces here that can work, man this should be a lot better. Number 88, Homemade by Jake Owen. Me crave some ice cold homemade. Sweet tea only mama knows how to make. Ugh, Jake, my man. I know you got screwed by this album cycle because you got a lot of breezy, low-key, boyfriend country ballads on that project that went overlooked and would have killed with the right push. Mexico in our minds, in it, made for you, and yet you went with this? Now, that's not saying this is bad, he's still got more breezy charisma than he knows what to do with, and the more inorganic hi-hat trap progressions are blended deep enough into Joey Moy's over-compressed production to not get that distracting. But let's be real, it's an utterly basic bro country list song that I'll forget in record time that leans a little bit too heavy on the down-home platitudes, almost to the point of pandering. I mean, it's passable, sure, rock charisma will get you there, but with a lot better songs in the album and this style of country feeling increasingly dated with time. Sorry, Jake. Not promising here. Number 85, Before You Go by Louis Capaldi. Play a show before you go. Look, the only surprise that we didn't get more Louis Capaldi songs sooner, especially when he went to number one with Someone You Love. It took the aftermath of an album bomb for us to get this single, swapping out the piano for a shuddering acoustic line, trying to split the difference between Shawn Mendes and George Ezra, which might as well describe Louis Capaldi's delivery here too, which is better than the howling he did on Someone You Loved, but isn't really good. And yet, am I the only one who feels like the groove of this song is being kind of improvised and only really stabilizes by that second hook, especially in the bass line? But if I'm highlighting my larger frustration with this, it's in the content and how it takes what could have been a pretty decently textured breakup song, and then he has said that it's about suicide and reflecting on what you could have possibly done to save them. Now, I've gone on the record saying that I really hate this framing method of making somebody else's death all about your Yourself. But that's not saying it can't be done well. Stay tuned for my next episode of On The Pulse for a main channel for an excellent example of that. But here, I don't get that impression because before you go, it's addressing somebody in the present tense. So did you not rewrite the hook when you chose to emphasize the suicidal subtext or theme? Or are you just resigning to someone going off to kill themselves and you didn't stop them? Either way, it just feels incompetent. Somehow I'm not at all surprised. Watch it become a hit. Number 82, Chasing You by Morgan Wallen. Out of whiskey, burning, going down, burning, going down. So 
Still, Whiskey Glasses felt like the sort of song that shouldn't have lasted as long as it did in the Hot 100 as a sodden, generally mediocre song that had a decent idea driven into the ground by really bad production. Oh, hi, Joey Moy again. Really wish I didn't hear from you. And yet, as such, we got another ballad from 2018 charting now. I guess it might be better than Whiskey Glasses, but not especially memorable. The brush drums off the warmer acoustics and organ, it's a nice touch. It's actually kind of surprising how organic it feels and Morgan Wall can sell Wistful Regret pretty effectively until you realize it's an extended list of everywhere he's trying to chase this girl even though he's currently in bed with somebody else. I mean, come on, dude. I was trying to give you the benefit of the doubt even with all the borderline obsessive chasing. But you highlighted you were with someone else on the hook and she's long gone and the quasi-romantic framing does not help. This is drive-by all over again. Uh, so no, Morgan Wallen. Oh, for two of my books really squandered potential here. Next, number 80, Letter to Nipsey by Meek Mill featuring Roddy Ricch. We did this shit, I wanna go to woe, 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 did this for my little brother, woe, 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 Back to songs getting a boost from the Grammys, we got another tribute to Nipsey Hussle, pairing two artists who worked with him in the past in a pretty natural fit, especially from Meek Mill's more conscious direction in the last year or so. And a list of a lot of Nipsey tributes, this is probably one of the best ones I've heard, even with some of the expected shortcomings. The squonking melody trying for a little more soul and hi-hat sounds a little bit thin, except for some cymbal hits, and Meek Mill drops a few more rhymes than he should. But outside of that, Meek Mill brings the introspective intensity that's been a good lane for him in confronting mortality and real vulnerability that he's probably not used to, and Roddy Rich now seeing his success in the face of all of that with the shout out to Nipsey's family and crew, in a way it feels really organic, alongside a really good hook from him. In other words, while I still think YG's tribute hits the hardest for me, this is also a really damn close second. Excellent work. Great song. Check it out. Number 34, Anyone by Demi Lovato. And now we got the big one. Demi Lovato returning to the spotlight with a piano ballad debuting at the Grammys, which when coming off of Sober in mid-2018, yeah, I was curious where this is going to place her now. And, okay. For a song that does feel like an extended cry for help, branching from feeling unheard, wishes feeling ungranted, a lapse in her own sobriety, and a plea for any sort of attention, off the start piano line, it works, and Demi's vocal delivery is as raw and powerful as ever, but it doesn't hit as strongly as Sober while repeating some similar ideas, and for as much as Demi Lovato is throwing herself into it, when you have a song otherwise so barren, it can feel oversold? lacking in subtlety, and yes, sometimes you don't need subtlety, but when Demi Lovato's last song took a very similar approach in subject matter and production and stuck the landing way more effectively, I gotta praise that more. I mean, this, it's fine, but let's be real. She has done better. And finally, number 21, B-I-T-C-H by Megan The Stallion. Anyway, you know you can't control me, baby. You need a real one in your life. You bitches ain't gonna give it to you, right? And now we're at a fascinating crossroads for Megan. She's got the boost riding along strong collabs and good memes, but can she knock one out of the park on her own? Well, here she's hopping on a smoky G-Funk groove with some great drum production and a strong hook, a very liberal reinterpretation of an old Tupac song, and calling out a guy who wants her to be more of a committed girlfriend than as much of a player as he is, especially when he's gonna call her a bitch anyway when she's going wild and he can't control her. And you know what, I kinda dig how Megan actually gets his underlying insecurity in this song, especially when she knows that he's gonna be petty and clingy when she's trying to keep it real, just as applicable, and the right sort of inversion that she can convincingly deliver. Plus on the hook as catchy as this and writing that feels pretty consistently tight? Yeah, it's a good song. I dig it. Nice work from her. But that's our week. Feels longer than it actually is, but also not really a bad week either. With Letter Nipsey by Meek Mill featuring Roddy Rich comfortably getting the best, with B-I-T-C-H by Megan Thee Stallion as our honorable mention. Now for the worst, really kind of a toss-up, but before you go by Louis Capaldi is getting the dishonorable mention, cause Chasing You by Morgan Wallen is such a disingenuous waste, it's easily getting the worst here. Kind of impressive how his screw-ups will just compound each other. Next week, Lil Wayne? Maybe? We'll have to see. Until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next